So tonight, we are very glad to have Anupama Kondo with us. Uh, it's actually the third time you came here, first time. We had a couple of projects, many times. We have 20 things. So friend of IAC, we're very happy to have you today um, to discuss about this rethinking materiality. I think a very inspiring work that you will present us tonight. Um, and I think also very interesting for IAC because you will present um, a very interesting way to work with craft, uh, with craft people, with uh, the human aspects that you can find in architectures and all the resources that you can find around the building site. Um, topics that we are very attached to in IAC um, and you work with tools that are fantastic uh, with the community um, and I think dialogue very well uh, with tool we have here at IAC. Um, so I'm very happy to have today uh, the honor to uh, introduce Anupama. Anupama, uh, fantastic architect initially from Bombay that now works between Berlin and uh, Madrid. Um, have her own office now, you told me, for 33 years in Should practice. Should I tell the introduction? <laughs> if you want, you can introduce yourself. I will give you a few words and then you can drop in. <laughs> no, no words. Um, teaching in many different universities, but recently in Potsdam, um, and a head of design at um, Auroville, a uh, very big inspiration for us, especially in 3DPA, uh, where we look a lot at earth architecture and architecture with natural resources. Um, that you will join tomorrow, uh, the event of the 3 dpa finals. So we're very excited about this. Um, she has an amazing work. She received a lot of awards. Uh, one of it that is fantastic is the RIBA uh, awards um, that have congratulated you for your architectural theory as well. Uh, so we're very excited to see your work. So please help me to introduce Anupama. <laughs> Should I? Yeah, I, no, I'll stand. Yeah, it's better. Thinking whether I should stand or sit. First of all, good evening. Um, I'm really. It's true that I'm really happy to be back here. I've come after quite a while now, but we have also collaborated with Yak. Remember for the project on your poster. So that was in 2014. So already quite a long time. No. Yeah, so um, I, I just want to say that I'm going to talk about materials and materiality. A lot of people um, link my work with material experimentation, but I want to not speak so much about the material themselves, but I want to talk about the human aspect with interacting with material for many reasons. I think, first of all, it is our uh, growing consciousness and intelligence that has led to us interacting with materials in a different way. Materials themselves are quite inert. You know, they are just molecules that uh, exist somewhere and we shift them and make architecture and then it moves around. But I feel in the, I feel, I'm going to speak about it like this here, especially with you today, because I feel quite disturbed when in the post-industrial discussion on materials, it is too much treated as an external matter, as if them by themselves the materials are good or bad, as if by themselves something is morally better to use and bad. Actually, all materials come from the earth. Right, even if it grows, if it's wood, it's just everywhere in the earth, everything exists and they have been combined and used differently. It is the industrial age which has over standardized certain things or applications. After that, um, you know, um, leaving, uh, withdrawing the human engagement and giving it off to machines. So there are some very intelligent humans who have navigated and created complex tools so that many other humans don't have to think at all. And some of the practices during industrial development have led to more less and less engagement of the human. And through that, the human has sometimes been alienated from the way things are made. And if you look at it by zooming out, it's very important to realize 
that where are we in the middle of all of this you know and how is materiality evolving and also when we've realized some of the negative uh, impact of industrialization and also colonization actually um, social social evolutions have led to um, environmental problems social economical problems through the way we build through the way we our current contemporary habits uh, you know so there's this mindless repetitions and then there is mindful experimentations happening throughout history and i think i like to talk about uh, what if we if we want to fix some of our global problems created by the way we are constructing architecture often without even knowing the source of any material because we have to order things only from catalogs now and so on we lose the source i mean we don't we are not aware of sourcing of material and through um through this kind of um, mystification that we create when we order from in between sources we ourselves don't know our source also why we are doing something what are we doing so we we are often quite lost inside our own silos and i would i think it's very interesting um, I don't want to talk about my projects one by one and bore you in the evening. I prefer to, because it's been a long career, 33 years of architecture practice straight out of college. I think it's what could be interesting is that some of the questions that made me do the things I did, which are of the nature that I mentioned, to critically review materiality in our times. I was doing it since the beginning of my career. So I think what could be useful is to discuss these questions with you some of them will be common some of them you will take further you know and i think that's what is interesting so in that light i would like to speak about this so i, I yes materiality has to be rethought i don't need to tell it to you you are doing in the middle of all that you are here doing a lot of experimentations you're building in full scale you're doing testing real materials real scale all those things which you will find in my work and teaching but i would like to make you aware through the outer expression of my projects what those inner discussions about i say inner as in what the mind of the person behind architecture construction uh, you know uh, inquires and what do we do something different i don't think the by by morally judging uh, uh, or superficially let's say earth versus cement and all of those type of things we create much more confusion with those easy checklists which you want to tick off you know it, it is equally silly to take earth from far away and make a construction or sometimes nostalgically and glorifying earth and bamboo construction in the time of sustainability problem is also like an escape in a way because just by doing that it's like i come from bombay if i were to use some vernacular technologies as it was used then i would be restricted to certain heights so all the concrete i will save in the building i'm going to spend in the commuting horizontal urban sprawl these are very complex questions I think what is interesting to to therefore uh, go into is in all those nuances of socio-economic implications of how humans interact with materials, and um, I hope some of that will um, be revealed. In fact, human resources is also almost a negative word in some other contexts, you know, because uh, if seen from colonization, it's uh, the the person's work is treated as a, a slave labor almost, you know, and I don't mean it in that sense. I mean, the resources that humans have compared to natural resources, natural resources are finite. So we are always worrying about them getting over, but actually they're just getting displaced in some other place and another place. So that is already a panic that I personally don't have um, about things getting over. The other side is that human resources are infinite. They are, um, whether we talk about our memory, our capacities, our muscle, our time, all the, 
all the intelligence and ingenuity, it's infinite. So if you use more of ourselves, we are not going to, uh, we are not going to pollute anything. We're not going to create any problems. We only will evolve. So I believe we need to experiment to evolve. That is actually my motto. But I started out doing it spontaneously because that was more fun. And the other thing was like you think, oh God, it's not attractive to do that at all, you know. So um, I just want to say that taking time, you know, your human time, is also one of the most underrated resources. So if we apply those, then we will lead to new solutions. I think I'm going to sit here now so that it's easy to operate. So, should I use something else? To, maybe it's put on a clicker? Oh, on, on this. Okay. Right. So just to, um, you know, I've, I think I've explained my whole lecture already in the introduction. So now just to illustrate some of that, you know, if you notice what happened before industrialization, that most, most architecture uh, was built with whatever was lying around. And luxury was had not to do with the material fetish about bringing Karara marble and et cetera. It was about the luxury of the application of human time. So to cultivate the eye, to cultivate the hand and to produce either very humble, simple things with the material you have lying around or much more refined things, which even today in a timeless manner, we find fascinating. So architecture outlives humans and it has actually the capacity to serve future generations. But the, the thing is the materials that, I mean, the know-how that is involved with building with whatever is lying around is the main point. We humans have built with earth, we have, if there is no trees, then you can't make, uh, you know, you can't have this type of roof. So then you do domes. If you have only earth, if you have ice, you build with ice. Basically, we, whatever was there, we have built with it. And that's how engineering evolved. And even that engineering that you learn in one local area can be applied to the other area because you have only two few universal laws like gravity and climate, which all these invisible laws, they become visible when the material expresses it. So the architecture is obviously not about the same stone and the rock which was lying there. Now it is like this because these invisible laws were made visible in, in the effort to create voids so that humans can inhabit them. So a lot of this discourse is not about the material, it's about the creation of the void with other energies and knowledges that we have. So, you know, you know, fast forward to today's uh, landscape. I have to show this because I come from Bombay. I'm sure some of you here are. Perhaps first when I walked in here, I thought I was in Bombay almost. You know, I when I speak in Europe, I have seen much more homogeneous people and I'm so excited to see what must be going on here in your class classes. But basically what has happened throughout the world post industrialization is that you've created some kind of over standardized, you know, you are normalizing repetition of habits. And on the contrary, they don't even let you easily do a different thing because there is all these norms made to further capture you so that we can't just do anything outside of the line. And that kind of standardization, on one hand, it doesn't serve, it, serve all our unique needs. Secondly, it is so expensive that all those who can't afford that standard, like you have to pay lots of money for a very shitty thing, basically, in all these high density cities. And yet, uh, if you can't have that, then more and more people are therefore 
considered informal. It's also a kind of colonization, actually, if you think that what is formal and, and what we used to call normal housing clusters are now called slums, you know, the self-building, like animals are still doing, you know, the birds, bees, spiders, nobody has a degree when they do intricate things, you know. But now the feeling is that some people know and everyone doesn't know. And there is this term called unskilled labor, which I was taught actually in our school as well, that there are skilled people and unskilled, but you realize that if in two days you can get a skill, you know, or so it's very interesting to, these are, this is how I, through my 30 years of practice have now, I will have a completely different take on it. But I discovered them and I started working with the tools, but most of all, which was a bit irritating, I'm speaking very like loose language huh? because no one's recording. You're recording? Okay. All right. I'll be very proper. So, I mean, you know, what is irritating in this, I have to complete that sentence at least, is the fact that, take this image for example, this is the new vernacular everywhere. You have a, a reinforced cement concrete frame and brick infilling. In the past, our ancestors have used brick to build massive spans, Notre Dame kind of heights with flying buttresses and all kinds of things. And now, even if you make only a simple two-story brickwork without columns, it's not supposed to work for all kinds of reasons. And everywhere I have been, um, you know, I, I've been seeing that it is what we are calling progress is not necessarily even intelligent. It, I'm not now dismissing the earthquake seismic codes and all that. Yes, we need standards. Um, but I believe that as much as we have to surrender to the universal laws, we, which we can't change, like gravity, we, we definitely must honor that, you know. And equally we have we must question all the man-made laws because they will not serve us permanently they have their they have their purpose you know nowadays every problem we encounter uh, is met with a new regulation and in former times regulation was not the only way to solve things some so some solutions are very decentralized and they are good if they are done one to one in that very spot instead of saying that one size fits all approach. I think that has a lot to do with industrialization. And we who have grown up, I don't, I don't mean I'm saying we, but actually I didn't grow up in that way. Many other people um, in in certain in in some countries that are mainstream industrialized have grown up a couple of generations that way. Like uh, you call, you know, my my son was saying, can I have an A4 when he wants a paper as a boy? when we moved here, you know? Uh, but we didn't grow up with clothes that were S, M, or L. And I can see that a lot of people who don't find their size, they never think that somebody has over-standardized all the bodies of the planet into three sizes. Instead, we think something is wrong with our body because, and a, each person is individually thinking that is not fitting me and suffering over it. And the same, if, if that's happening to a garment, then imagine how, how much of that is happening to architecture. So these are things I used to think about. And um, I used to ask myself, all this chasing for efficiency, what is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? Because in the context we had, uh, you know, in Bombay and thereafter, in the, wherever I wandered, uh, I found that a lot of, I mean, this is not, uh, this is not something that I realized then, but when I look, you know, at, you know, I've, I've thought, my, I kept trying to find out why are we making buildings that we don't like, and more, many people, um, you know, we are creating these cities that nobody seems to actually like, so I used to wonder why, where it comes from, and I think there is, uh, something about the idea that time is money. If a human is involved, then let's cut back on that time 
and you know it's a bit too easy a generalization this kind of chasing efficiency because then you know if you've saved so much time where is the time you know i used to wonder like why are people more stressed if they are getting more efficient we were lazy laid back okay and then there were people who are very efficiently doing everything and it gets more and more stressful life is like that people have less and less time so i realized that all that has to be thought and while i started creating my own time i started realizing that if you involve all the other agency that human resources have um maybe you would if you took twice the amount of time i'm not trying to say we should delay things i'm just saying that we have to think before we act even if it if if you are you have not managed to solve the thing and you have to build under pressure many of us are actually doing that kind of thing and i found that if you actually instead take the time to think and understand what are you constructing the thing with understand all the complexities behind architecture the first project may be slow the next one will be faster but each action is empowering and eventually you very easily will uh, you know overtake the the other one uh, the other trend so my early years were about taking a bike going around the landscape and all the basic things that i saw being made i started looking at it from the lens of being pre industrial or post industrial and wondering whether while using machines in our eagerness to save our time and not do things which we could we don't need to bother to repeat like washing clothes in a washing machine um to just realize sometimes when the habit starts taking over and uh, over generalizing you know or being applied in a not uh, in a way that it's not serving us so i started realizing i started going to the source of how materials are procured and try to see how it is there and you know if you look at old brick kilns like these um in india you notice that the the brick making is part of a, or any other material sourcing is part of a large territorial activity and those people don't work 9 to 5 in this factory there are some months when the clay that collects needs to be spent there are other months where they are growing those those casuarina trees which are used as scaffolding but also the thinnings are used for the fuel and these people are also probably rice farmers there's a lot of things people did according to season there also there is a standardization so if you were produce bricks in a factory you'll have to have a different kind of oven they are supposed to be efficient again so i i you would go into how efficient the brick that you get out of this kind of kilns that you make locally those bricks are actually the kiln is a construction like a kind of jenga type of construction where you have to stack all your bricks inside and then the bricks themselves are the walls and then you plaster mud plaster it insulate and fire and when you finish you have the field again so the outer brick is um is not as well fired but you'll use it inside a wall where you don't need it to be so well fired so we used to deal with the non standard complexities when you go to make now if you go to make a brick e very well fired equally first of all you don't need it in the needs also very few bricks are actually facing the weather and many others do not so many you know we 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 don't think about that easily so when you order a standard thing you are already over designing is what i realize and half of the wastage that goes into you know our resources uh, consum consuming them mindlessly has to do with those type of standardizations in these what you see is that the clay which is from wherever there is clay with the given fuel um this is sorry i'm i've put in a mistaken slide here but this is similar for the lime that you can use instead of cement but basically i wanted to speak a little more about the kiln 
the brick kiln, this type of kiln, it produces the best possible brick, the, the highest strength with that clay and with that fuel. I We were taught in our school to appreciate the wire cut brick, which came at a much bigger cost, rather than using this aesthetically, and at least a lot of buildings don't need that strength. The thing is, if you go to a modern factory, say like Peterson in Copenhagen, that's being handmade too, but there you'll see that the brick, the, that they have all the colors. So if you want to have yellow bricks, brown bricks, you know, which is fine, but it should all buildings be, or should all only that kind of thing be available, you know? It means it, it, it's like how the diet we have. Every fruit from all over the planet is available at our grocer, grocer, you know? So it's a question of realizing if you what it is to do local. It's not just how have the local villages used a, a brick roof or a brick tile. It's much more than that. It's our approach to making anything. So that is actually what I, those type of things, which you don't see in the pictures is what I wanted to discuss with you because I think, especially in your school, because you're very engaged with making, I think what I like about the robotic uh, opportunity is again, you can be custom made. You can again, you know, in the industrial phase, you had to make that machine who can only do that. So we were forced to make millions of something to be able to afford it. So maybe there are those opportunities to again that our clothes fit our very, very various bodies and our buildings actually serve us. Maybe those are things we can work with, you know. But um, so I started realizing also initially I was seeing that because when a society does not develop with equity, with when everybody doesn't uh, have cannot afford the same things, then you know if you abruptly stop using some materials and just go into certain standards, you're displacing people actually overnight. A lot of those kilns, again, I'm not, a lot of those kilns uh, have been stopped even in, in the, in every five years, you see all kinds of uh, things uh, not available anymore. I'm not actually a nostalgic person who's attached to that, you know, but I am attached to the loss of knowledge and and uh, and also the awareness of this deep interdependencies between materials and other things that a society does at the spot where things are quarried so through that when i talk about uh, humane architecture i think it's all of this it's about being humane for the users but also humane for the makers and what materials they handle and knowing all of that you know it demystifies a lot of things and you can make clear decisions and to first of all realize what it means to use a local material so uh, so initially when i was doing buildings which were literally made from what is under like you know i started realizing every everywhere you stand is a material you know and what and see what architecture can be made with that instead of and so there you it means you're taxing yourself a bit more and uh, people are going to tell you this will be more expensive. The, there's going to be all those typical discouragements to do that. I mean, they also tell you, like, it's like saying the mango on your own tree is going to be more expensive and you can afford it more if you came to the other country and bought it from Lidl. And even it's true. That's the thing. So, but, uh, but, but as we will become aware and when we know that the costs incurred may not be paid by you but they did get uh, we are just not paying the bill the problem is shifted somewhere so it's still uh, i used to try to understand the origin of materials and that automatically the awareness started seeping into my uh, work through just a general curiosity for example this is a human scale of extracting material in the good old way still being done you'll see that um, uh, behind there on the far right are, are villages where people uh, used to make grinding stones and they still know how to perfectly uh, get the level 
you know, like to level uh, granite and to extract it by these old methods that you make a hole, the, the, they know the material, how it will split. And it's, it's you know, even they, they carry those stones by rolling them over logs and very intelligent, not using uh, effort. And now because they've made a big jump to the machines, they do not know, we, we don't have those kind of codes there, but this kind of sound of chipping the granite was very different from the machines and now a lot of people cannot hear anymore. So, I mean, there are, I'm not making any judgment here. I'm just saying we are rapidly transitioning and what is important, it would be exciting if you see how is the human being evolving and are we evolving in a, like what is progress? Are we, do we know more than our grandparents about those things, you know, or, uh, you know, are we, are, what's the best we can do? That's, that's what I was trying to understand. And so even though my architecture uh, took contemporary applications, you know, of those things I saw, uh, a lot of things like these, this, this is a space, it's like a kind of showroom for fancy products. Um, the, the, stones are like it's like a there is a keystone and it is all kept in loose pebbles actually like like we have in cobblestones and or you know so i started using some engineering knowledge uh, and trying to use significantly less material of whichever material it was that um, i was trying to use so very early in my uh, career, I had I had been influenced by you know other architects and engineers who were doing things alternatively at that time. It was in the early nineties, eighteen and uh, late eighties that I graduated. And uh, so initially, I did uh, realize. I mean, I, I always started looking at what skills are available, mm -hmm. who are the people, who are the makers. I I looked at the context critically from the point of view of what material is there but also what skill is there and the skill could be you know given the opportunity to expand and you know there were potters in this area for example nobody is going to buy these cooking pots which are still you know uh, they, they try to make now flower pots but you know it, they they, they they are losing their livelihood due to urbanization and I I was thinking that this could sort of guarantee their livelihood and also in many of these regions you have terracotta as roofing tiles and they need a lot of wood to support them so it was it was interesting to try to create catenary curves and that are insulated to some extent and load bearing and to be able to uh, apply this kind of things in roof roofs which where you would be able to save a lot of structural steel and get some insulation uh, you know we noticed also a lot of the standard reinforced cement concrete roofs in most of the a large part of india has a very hot either hot and humid or hot and dry climate and when you come home in the evening most people's homes are hotter than outside so first we heat our building and then we try to cool it artificially so you know i had lived in a hut for some time and i noticed that that i had a, when you grow up in bombay you think that's a normal thing that architecture does but then when you experience some vernacular life you realize that it is a the problem was introduced also by building and then we are trying to solve it so um, this is my own house where it was possible to experiment more things than you could with a client's uh, budget. But then each each thing that you built empowered you to just naturally take on other experiments. And you know, you can just take it in your stride. You don't have to learn everything. Risk is not like one big thing that the whole building will collapse or nothing. There are little things you'll find out this is more expensive. This is, you have to tweak it more in the next project You improve a bit more and so on. So through this kind of knowledge, and you see me straight from college, not knowing anything. <laughs> but I, I, I'm happy to show this picture because there's literally nothing over there. And, and I, I really realized that there is not nothing. When I came there, 
I was, because I was conditioned and indoctrinated in the kind of way we are taught, I assumed we go to small places and say, oh, there's nothing here. And we realize, no, first of all, we are here and there's something. Now I would see, you know, these are, these are potters. So you see in the foreground, the material is there. In the background, some skills are there. And now I look at the photo and I think all what is there, you know. And I also realized if you use what there is a lot of, then you create abundance. And when you try to use something that you don't have around, you create directly shortage. These are very common sense, uh, my common sense uh, approach to economics, you know, that why would you not use what's lying around? So, and then while you do that, you also, I think there is also um, something that I, um, I also try to do is to appreciate, you know, yeah, human, the human hand, the human mind, the intelligence to be able to experiment, you know, and to just know that, yeah, if you see a lot of people who've not gone through typical education, they are actually quite open to experiment. It is only in a particular, in you know, um, mindset where we think that it's such a big deal to do something new, but actually, it's a natural thing in evolution that everything is done different because yesterday's things don't work often for today. So looking at the brick makers and, you know, also looking for others who know things that I don't know, like Ray Meeker, uh, uh, a ceramist whom I met, I was able with his guidance also and with others to be able to produce high quality products through very benign sort of local firing without needing complex ovens and uh, not looking at efficiency as only that one object, but seeing the totality and the synthesis of the whole thing. And so as much as the engineers did not believe and uh, want to do those projects, to exactly the opposite, the craftsmen were very eager and they were, they are very happy to make something else. And we, started doing tests and so on and applying them in full scale. So the, so this is, uh, so here you see the celebration of the handmade weaker brick. It doesn't even have a one is to two proportion. So none of all those bonds that we are taught, etc. cetera, uh, we, we're suddenly liberated from all that baggage because even the brick was in one is to two. So you had to, you know, and that led to thinking about everything, you know, finding out the brick is so irregular, sometimes it's twice as thick as the other. Why? I realized while doing that, why is that thicker? Because they are casting it on a field, which is so cheap, instead of having any infrastructure. So the ground is like that, and the mold is standard, but then you get a thicker brick sometimes. And is it worth it? Yeah, it's a big, you know, the cost to benefit ratio is amazing, I think today, you know. So I realized that if you design uh, knowing that the brick is like that, like I put the alignment on the top of the brick instead of the bottom. So I did those design strategies where I even didn't have to um, sketch each and every brick, you know, because I also am not a control freak. I want to tell the logic and then the mason can do it. So and you see it came out okay. And then as I, uh, you know, went along, um, I was able to use also the cooking pot. I, I got an idea how to also use the cooking pot. Uh, they use it for uh, rice. Um, nowadays, you don't use it too often, maybe on festivals. But I started, uh, I, I had the idea to create coffered ceilings with lost form work to be able to have a bigger effective depth for the concrete and then reduce two bars of steel out of every three. So now the steel bars that only are at every 45 centimeter, for example, and by um, filling mud plaster between the lips of the pot, I could just wash it away. So I don't need to plaster. I have a clean ceiling. My form work can be all the rubbish planks or whatever is lying around. You know, so I was trying to, because we were in a place where we didn't have resources, but I realized that sometimes having less is not a bad thing. It makes you think more. 
and then in the end you become a little cleverer then you know because you didn't have the money so you have to you still want to have a good standard thing and then you strain yourself more so so there were so many more applications of this these we started by this time extruding them so that you could get flat ceilings if you still need the terrace to be insulated and if it's an interim floor which doesn't need then you can use the you can save progressively different amounts of steel and cement and concrete and yet meet the climatic demand so yeah I'm going to show some ferro cement. Those fins are going to appear a bit later, but this is the house. And it was very difficult to save this house because I was experimenting seven, eight ideas for other projects. And so I have to prevent the house from looking like a cacophony, you know, somehow that was my biggest task. But it's good because people don't realize that it was my lab. In fact, this house, the drawings of this house and the model have been acquired by MoMA. And I used to always feel that people will notice that, you know, that these all, how to make it all, all these experiments belong to not look like a lab, but like a home later. So, yeah, I think it was, I can say now that it was successful. And uh, yeah, it, it's also a lot of experiment spatially as well. But Prior to building that house, I lived in this house for 10 long years. I had actually, um, with a, with a big, like when I just landed in Oroville, a lot of people were living very simply in huts and, you know, and we have, we've been used to seeing thatch huts and, you know, temporary, we, what we call kacha buildings, you know, that is not even considered uh, to be, again, these are all these standard classifications, but what I discovered uh, living, uh, you know, living like this, you know, with uh, we had uh, two solar panels and a car stereo and 12 volt lamps that I couldn't afford so many of. So I would take one lamp with a long cable and take it here and there because I realized I am the same person who will be sitting in all these places. Why do I need so many light fixtures? You know, I'm just going to go. So there were all these ways of just, you know, living experimentally. And in these, while living in this house, I learned a lot of things. I learned that when you don't build with so-called fixed, fixed material, like concrete, actually the weathering and the life of a building is not just one day that the, it will stay up to there and then it's no more. It is, on the contrary, the rope will have a different life. The thatch has to be changed every three years, but the structure will remain if you didn't change your thatch every three years when the leaves were rotting then you would have to you will ruin your wood so then you'll have to change that and so every element like our own body the cells will renew itself in different cycles so all of this is actually nothing is so standard and what I loved about the discovery of staying with in such a house was to realize and that was for me like a big revelation that if you standardize and use timber as opposed to round wood, you have to wait for the same tree to grow that fat so that you can cut a rectangle out of it. How many more years you need? You know, and, and these kind of things. Um, so it's, it's just, uh, you know, some, that's why I think time is a very important resource because if you don't take time to think, you won't realize all these things. You know, even me, over every few years, I'm thinking differently about it. And it's important to take the time. And I think those years actually taught a lot of things and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of materials have been experimented. Um, you mentioned Auroville. Um, so there was an earth, there is an earth lab there. And um, there is, a, you know, a rammed earth. He brought the technology, um, Satprem, um, where, he came from Grenoble, and he uh, there was the, they, they, there was this kind of discovery to add few uh, like five three to five or seven percent of cement to make earth stabilized. Now today I also I've done building uh, buildings with that. Today I see it differently because in Germany, if you mix cement, it's not allowed to be called earth anymore. 
it's it's like a dirty cement it's not called because it's true that much cement it makes uh, it 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 has a different properties than earth so you know i also prefer earth buildings to be really earth i mean there are a lot of advantages and it's it's a local material you can it's it's very interesting i have done the wall house uh, foundations with rammed earth which is stabilized so anyway there was so many experiments and experiences this is a co-housing project i'm going to go a little faster because i think uh, yeah the pictures will speak for themselves all those things i explained these are applied in a bigger scale so you can see that the technique was being tested in my place for being applied in a bigger project often but one of the more radical experiments that uh, I did was, I think, um, in this technology called baked in situ earth construction. So Ray Meeker, uh, about uh, whom I also did my PhD, had uh, pioneered uh, this technique inspired by Nader Khalili from Iran, to who, you know, they discovered that earth can be fired instead of modular you know, production uh, in a factory and being fired there, what would happen if you would fire it in situ? So these are easier said than done. You can imagine how difficult it is to fire a big pot even and not have it crack. So, uh, but in this technique, what is attractive for me is that cement is also not necessary because fire is the cement. The clay is being it's all getting vitrified together. So you have to build a structure essentially in earth. It has to work as an oven. You have to have holes there below for oxygen to enter for combustion, but also holes to feed some, you know, start the fire. Um, and then the rest, the house is a kiln. It has to be designed. It should stand as a mud structure. Then it should work as a kiln. Then it should, it's very complicated. Uh, Humans are really, you know, I mean, it's amazing that, that, that people pursue these type of things, actually, if you think about how complicated it is. And then when it is being baked, you know, when you see when a bread is put in the oven, you see how it, it starts to wobble. That's going to happen to the clay before it becomes burnt. And so other things have to be considered. And after meeting all this criteria, it has to meet the criteria of a home as well. So there are many limitations, but it's still exciting, the potential. You see the bricks have to be stacked, so the oxygen should come. It should, yeah, it's very complicated. But then the whole thing cooks for three or four days. And then, uh, of course, I forgot to mention how complicated the engineering limitations, not complicated, every, every, technique, every material comes with constraints. But the problem is, it, th those are real constraints. The problem is our imaginary constraints. I think that is what I'm fighting, you know? I think we are building with a lot of constraints which are imaginary, I feel. These are physical, real constraints. So one should listen to them. But then, after a couple of uh, days, this gets baked, and then it has to be cooled, and then you can, source the bricks and you could you know shift the uh, the perception of a uh, of the house building as a consumer of resources but turn it into a generator of local building materials because you can put all kinds of you can make your own sizes see i i also made slender bricks that you can hold in your hand because i worked a lot by then with a non you know uh, the British module of brick because I realized how easy it is on the hand because those of you who lift a normal brick you'll see how heavy is one brick the, the the one which we do in the standard way but earlier bricks used to be very thin you can look at it in uh, old Roman buildings so you see the patch there behind you know the the brickwork the pixelated brickwork you see normally is because the bricks lied in different areas of a kiln, but here it's homogeneous. So you have like, you know, the, the color tones are like watercolors, like, you know, it's going to be seen in, in patches. It's a different kind of look, but this is a an image from Ray Meeker's um, work. He used to 
initially when he used to fire houses, he he needed lots of products to put inside there. So, but there is uh, so many things you could do, you know, like, uh, see, there are roofing tiles, pipes down there, uh, toilet pans, glazed tiles for floor finishes, some lanterns, uh, all kinds of things, water pipes. So this is the kind of architecture that resulted. Um, these are homes for homeless children. And, uh, you know, it's all finished. There was really no, there was very little budget for some of these. But, um, you know, these are also finished with broken tiles. So I'm just moving a bit on to um, ferro cement. I've talked about a bit about how vernacular technologies have the potential through the round wood buildings and so on to be also continued to be experimented with and to be optimized. Then there are ways, uh, some you know, there are local ways of building which you can critically examine and, you know, transfer technologies, um, op, you know, create, uh, you know, you know, through engineering, um, make them much more um, efficient. But then there's also this area where high energy materials, which are being also kind of over-designed, like can be minimized, you know, for me, ferro cement, is a material that I am really, really attracted to because you can try to replace uh, large diameter bars with very thin chicken meshes, you know? So, and because ferro cement necessarily is very thin, it's about two and a half centimeters. It could also go down to one, uh, 12 millimeters. Um, and, um, you know, you can, of course, to be able to explore the whole infinite world of meshes, fibers, etc., and different matrices, you, you need to be able to use these very thin materials. You need to um, fold, bend, and find rigid, you have to find forms that strengthen these thin uh, elements. So, so again, one has to, it has a lot to do with form development. So I find that also interesting. So one of the expressions of that is a is what we call fulfill homes. It's a modular home. By folding as boxes, you make it rigid. But then these these can be homes can be put up in a week. Um, the finishes are embedded. So sometimes even wash basins, fins, uh, etc., are all contained. And and for me, it was interesting that this can be does not even have to be done in a factory because these are such tiny elements. People can do it in the backyards of their houses, etc. Masons. Ah, oh, yeah. There is a picture. This was shown in Venice, uh, 20, 2016, in the Biennale. Um, and there, uh, you see that purple piece. It has a wash basin embedded. I also found it interesting. On the right hand side is a toilet sanitation unit with a shower and a, a toilet unit, but you can see how lightly a roof can span um, that kind of uh, four and a half meters. So for me, it was very interesting to do all these experiments since I'm a professor in Berlin. I have worked, uh, you know, have used the opportunity to also test with the engineer, engineers in, uh, you know, Mike Schleich's laboratory with Aunt Goldach there, professor. We did a workshop with uh, engineers to be able to make some of these and test them and see what happens, you know, instead of breaking, you know, it has a, it has a very ductile property. And so I think it could be quite interesting for seismic uh, and for disaster relief, et cetera, where very quickly with little resources, you have to come up with habitat. So, Interesting here is also the fact that it forms, as I said, will contribute to rigidity. So if you want to use it as large span structures, I have taken the example of some crease patterns from origami um, standard shapes to be able to make it so light and to be able to perhaps cast on paper, corrugated paper. This was before COVID and all the Amazon thing, you know, but I was already looking at how much, 10 years ago, actually, this was done when I was uh, in Australia teaching in Brisbane. So these could be folded and carried. I was inspired by a tsunami that had happened 
in South India. And I thought uh, in a hurry, we often produce uh, hasty buildings. We produce sometimes also ugliness hastily, you know, because we're in a big hurry and we don't take time to think. So I, th I thought, you know, let's take a couple of years to just think what, uh, so when a, when a crisis comes, you can put it up in four days, but that's not the time to start thinking because it's not likely to be very nice. But you see how little mesh is involved. And this is one version. I built four or five of these uh, prototypes to check where, where it's easy to do. In this case, uh, it's without form work. This is a one to two scale prototype, but it's about three meters by three meters, just a shelter, just to look at what, how that material performs, you know? So yeah, there's a lot of experimentation that I'm uh, doing with cements as well and pigments. These are from my exhibition in um, Louisiana Museum near Copenhagen. So there was a big solo show and Another area, I'm now coming to my little, uh, you know, encounter with IAC. In fact, probably that's where we first met uh, because Benedetta had uh, invited me to build a temporary pavilion among six uh, for that uh, 300th year here in the city. And um, it was called Library of Lost Books. And uh, we had done... I had started experimenting with paper and the strength of paper because I had the ferro cement exercises behind me. And then here we did uh, an exhibition in Museo Eco in uh, Madrid. And there we, we decided that the only material in this imaginary country are what they have there, which are a lot of old catalogs. So there was an exhibition where there was a workshop component. So we did all kinds of roofing system, all kinds of, they, there was lots of experimentation. We did one here too, one workshop. And uh, eventually we had, like this is a sofa. I mean, you can see how strong that was. You could sit on it. But what we did here, we had of course tried a lot of things of which finally we did this. We had uh, taken, um, you know, I was also, uh, thinking about how to use, um, because we were we were in uh, Salvador Segi, you know, the square. And uh, there they had the Filmoteca and the library. And so there they had books, etc. So we, but we didn't find the same type of one to be able to do the investigation we did. So we had to start from scratch. We decided to use thinner magazines and we vacuum packed them, uh, uh, how ham is packed, you know, in an easy machine. That was Areti's, I think, contribution, um, a very big contribution to it. And it made these books very rigid because when you take the air out, it, it made the whole thing very stiff. And that allowed us to create canopies here. And uh, I have a really good memory of that time, you know, working here. And uh, I think the, tree, the, the support system were done like trees because somehow, you know, you spend a lot of, you cut trees and you make paper and now you're making trees out of paper with the waste paper, which you afterwards didn't use, you know. So something, it was just a funny idea to get some shade, but also the geometry, etc. And like in many of my projects, it's also inspired a bit by the site and that the thing looks like it kind of belongs there. And all those seats there. Uh, you know, were used. So it was a temporary pavilion done with very temporary means. But I think it's very interesting. Urban waste is also a very interesting thing because I think architecture has a potential to permanently capture all these materials into architecture. And also, not only in architecture, but also in the architectural process, you know, that in places where when we, we don't have resources, we don't mind adjusting our windows a little bit or depending on what you found. I think even in the processes, form work, and so many places we waste so much, um, so much, you know, and that we make that process, form work, et cetera, unusable in the next thing. So I do, I thought about it, not because it's fashionable, but really we, I came from a context where we were compelled to be ingenious. Otherwise we couldn't have had the solution. So I don't want to take all the credit for it, but you know, there's a lot of things you can do when you your teacups are cracked. You can 
recycle it into masonry. But basically, at the time, there were like your place is quite uh, unique, but there are not so many places where architecture can be studied through one to one experimentation. But I always tried to bring these approaches in normal academic uh, environment where students can take part in workshops where they can confront real materials, real scale, real place and real people in the process and not to wait till you graduate and be so alienated that you don't even know that you're alienated. You know? so, so some of the projects like that was a watchtower um, in the botanical garden. But here also these type of projects were very much full of students there or sometimes like in Mexico here we had we had done a, a project only over two days. Sometimes just a one or two days is a lot of time once you put your hands into the thing. And I've seen also here with all the digital work you do, you do a lot of analog, right? Are you still doing that? You have to, because you can't, before you even know what you want to design the machine for, you have to know the material only yourself, right? So that that is the thinking with the hands is a very important component. So in this case, this was in Mexico City, some kind of installation, or this was in Segovia where we, you know, just to have excuses for students to be able to build something. Sometimes there's a party and you have to stack your bottles. So we're saying, why not, you know, in the Hay Festival, um, we did, we, we had to distribute this water for the people. So it can be, it can teach people, you know, it can teach them even to lay out one of those Eladio Dieste walls. You have to know geometry, you have to know a lot of things. And you need to think in full scale. These are denim waste from in Ahmedabad. There are mountains of denim waste because they make jeans for the rest of the world. I think uh, so all the all the shapes that you the, that, that don't go into the jeans get left behind. So I always say, what can I do with the shapes? So, you know, so, yeah. So anyway, I think I'm going to, I don't know, I think it's been already very long. I'm going to just um, show some of those, um, you know, students, uh, you know, being involvement in some of my work. This is the one-to-one -one recreation of my wall house in Venice. Uh, David Chipperfield had asked me to come there. We had collaborated in the other one, I think, 2016. Huh? You all had, I forgot to mention, or maybe it will appear here. We did many things actually together, I realize now. So here we have built the whole house, you know. Uh, it was quite unprecedented, even the landscape and garden and everything. Uh, you know, just like the architecture of the, the original space is an architecture in ruin. It exposes how the building was made. So we kept ours a bit unfinished. So it also reveals, uh, so you don't have to explain anything, you know, you can see uh, the whole thing. But we also added some new components here. We did the, some roofs with wine bottles and, uh, you know, but what is interesting is that if you go to an actual building site, I find it very, very sad that in architecture courses, you only learn to do a concept stage and then the next semester, again concept, and then you don't learn the, the design goes on till the end. You know, we don't get to know that even. So, yeah, so I think I create all these opportunities mostly to compensate what is not permissible sometimes in academia. So, yeah, the students got the chance to build and do everything. Now I have to touch upon Auroville because a lot of the experiments that you have seen uh, me doing happened to be in that place, Auroville. So when I left Bombay, I lived in this laboratory city, which is not yet a city. It's a city in the making, but it's going on for a really long, 55 years. Um, I had the good fortune to work alongside Roger Angers, the chief architect, who had made a pedestrian walkable city model already many years ago, predicted that cars are going to be problematic. So the whole urbanism of high density was created with covered walkways and all that very, very compact, but also looking, what I found very interesting is that these, his idea to not have a uniform height, but to allow um, 
high rise buildings to not be random towers breaking all the other urban fabric but to integrate them in a more horizontal fashion even though they are tall so there's a lot of intricacies in this but i had a really great memories of working with him and through him i think the urbanism part in my experience got added because he used to give me areas to uh, work out as i was working as an architect and he would tell me do this i did the city center and i also was involved in getting the master plan approved and many of my buildings like this youth hostel are there uh, in oroville and for the last two years i have been uh, appointed the head of urban design um, i took this up mainly to transition some of the things that i had worked with roger to so that you know that it is passed down to whoever wants to work with it so uh, yeah one of the projects which i'm ending with is that one of the tallest residential towers i have uh, with about 8000 people resident uh, in that is a thing which we developed in um, greater detail and the idea is that inside of this there are little communities of co-housing urban co-housing of about 50 to 60 people sometimes 20 different groups clustering around common facilities common kitchens and so on and and trying to share more chores but also share resources and to be able to uh, you know the future of um, nuclear families also not something to be taken for granted so people will be gravitating towards chosen families or clusters and you know one need not uh, maybe who knows in the future we may not be gathering over a common kitchen maybe we are very going to eat very individually somebody will eat keto somebody will be vegan and maybe we'll share other things but maybe we have workspaces all that has to be explored so that was being explored here and uh, not only um, through the urban form there is Jan Gale uh, discussing whom I consult from time to time. Uh, this was uh, done in a, during my guest professorship in Stuttgart where we were looking at housing and we had also in Louisiana Museum, we had the space that I don't have. I wanted to build the whole, uh, I took the chance to build the urban model in one is to 50 scale to understand it first of all myself, you know. So through and plugging in, inviting students to plug in their projects. I was at that time teaching at Yale. So the, their students, the Danish students, uh, my Potsdam students, they have all contributed to housing clusters inside this where we wanted to have, because in Auroville, the land cannot be owned. It all belongs to the commons. So that is the most interesting part for me for, from Auroville where everything could be redefined with a new mobility and new ownership. Um, so I, I, I tried to create, um, you know, the main um, pedestrian, like the community street on the fourth floor above the trees. And so it's got, it's, it had some of those aspects, but in the background, there were some of my uh, researches for facades of future building from power generation capacity um, to, you know, the pink paint is something which can generate power and it can be added to concrete as a German firm that does it but most of all we were in the urbanism exploring how to retain human scale even when we go high density I think this is a problem all architects in the world will have to address because we it we know that it becomes you know slipping out of the human scale and we were attempting through this type of forms which are not low rise and high rise but gently going across and creating these mountainscapes and focusing on coexistence in a in a fashion which the old uh, towns still had that quality for chance encounters and kind of a, a human intimate neighborhood and um, so um, you know uh, among all the other things we were testing for the facade are also integrated water wastewater systems and urban farming to build into the facade according to the direction etc and with that, I would like to end. Thank you. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you so much for a journey through all those experiments that are very nice and buildings uh, that we can live in 
Uh, that seems amazing. Um, Belize, there will be some question uh, that will arise. Um, maybe to just trigger uh, a first uh, 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 discussion. I'm 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 really always uh, curious to see how uh, you learn so much uh, with the people, letting them space, no, in the uh, design process. Mm -hmm. You said designing all the way till the construction site, no. So letting space in the initial design. So that in the construction site there is actually still creation, there's still um, innovation happening there. When actually we put the material together and we let space for the artisans and the craft to um, to reveal and and finally to participate in this design. Also a shared authorship finally uh, in the thing that I I don't think we've been teached this in general in school of architecture, but also a lot of architects in our cultures tend to be a bit reticent uh, yeah. in this. No. Um, so I, I would like to, um, so we try to see this as well in digital fabrication, in robotics, how we can have like a design decision taken close by. Um, maybe I would like to hear a bit in your experience uh, when you try to uh, work in architectures in Europe, how people, clients, companies, uh, people react to this. I, I don't try to work in Europe. <laughs> but really, it's, way. it's a fact. No, I'm not against it, but... Uh, um, so, I mean, I just can't give a concrete answer. Uh, I have done this kind of temporary things, you know, but um, but I can only say one thing that I think the fact that I did that is also accidental, I think, partly the advantage of when you're very young, when you start your practice, um, because you don't want to work in the typical offices. So it's it's one in one way you're innocent, but in another way, you know that you don't want to land up doing that, you know. So in that, because you're young, I guess you know, you're more close to what you don't know. You know that you don't know many things. And I think you're more open to involving other people who are doing it because I think the more you crystallize that you think you are supposed to know. So when you go to a site, you have to be the one everybody's expecting the solution. So many people, I think it has much more to do with the the personality than the even the actual thing, you know, because I think a lot of times people are not very secure in themselves to say, look, I have no idea, like, or, you know, or if, or, or they are maybe not so approachable. Like I found it quite, uh, I think the craftsmen felt comfortable to tell me that I, if then they saw me struggling, trying to do, they said, can we try this? I have an idea. And I would always say, uh, yeah, what would you, what, what, what are you thinking, you know? And I didn't, I think it, it has something more to do with an attitude, I would say today. Because I think uh, if I would just think it's a European thing, which I do also, by the way, often think. But I think if I would think that, then it's, it, I would make it look like as if what I did was easy. It was also not easy, you know, what I did, you know, to be always living in that, edge of what you know and don't know is also kind of, you know, but I also find to be in the comfort zone of what you know, and therefore limiting everything you do only based on that is also a bit of, it's a bit scary for me also, you know, that, that idea of stagnation and just, you know, because since nobody knows it, it's, it's a very crazy thing. Like here now in all the competitions, I'll tell you why I don't like the idea of working in Europe. To build, uh, to do a competition for a school, you have to show you've done schools, right? I mean, what is this kind of approach? I mean, even even now, one friend was saying that there are all these small studios are suffering because even though he did schools, he didn't do in the last three years. Now, there's a new thing that you should have done in the last three years. I mean, I think these are, there are some practice uh, habits that automatically exclude experimentation of any kind and I'm not even talking about radical I'm not talking about cooking a house just some silly thing which I would today not even call experimentation even those are not allowed but I think it is not I try to just ask myself if whenever I meet a resistance I try to see is it a because of gravity or because of something real because of the budget or is it just people don't want to go there because they've already closed the door 
to think about it. And I find most of the problems are there. And by the way, I found in, in, in academia and in studios, many people are doing buildings where they don't care about gravity, on the other hand. Because they don't, there's no gravity police coming and, you know, scaring them. It's a human thing, you know, which people are submitting to somehow. <laughs> Very inspiring. I think we have um, often the problem opposite here with like digital fabrication and robotics, trying to be a control freak of everything that will go happens. And then when we come to construction, we understand no, the material have a say, the gravity have a say, um, and, and we need to break some rules. We need to be a bit innovative. Um, so I think it's very inspiring to see. Uh, yeah. Your your your. No, I I actually love gravity, and I keep it sounds like see gravity. You do whatever you want and instantly it won't it won't fall after 10 years. Just now it will fall. Like, you know, it gives you immediate feedback. It's so good. Very good. How many buildings failed? Um, would you like uh, to... Oh, so many hands going on here. <laughs> uh, you want me? Who? I've seen two hands here. Which hands? Yeah, there. Okay. Let's see if I succeed. Who was the uh, hand? Had a project in the fifth. Sorry. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I really look up to you most. Of and uh, I wanted to ask you regarding uh, the way you look at time. Like, that's something I really uh, felt connected to. And uh, as essentially, like, you, you, you have this perspective about uh, taking time, right? And uh, I mean, when. Uh, I would like you to ex expand on that, especially because uh, time is like the always ticking and uh, it's the only actual luxury to speak, right? Yeah. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think um, I talk about, I, I started uh, talking about time because I feel in architecture, we talk a lot about space, but it's equally about space and time. Because of many reasons, we you know we talk about conservation or we talk about vision, we talk about future, we talk about how long things last. We so many aspects have directly to do with time, but the the idea of taking time was not meant so much um, as it may suggest in one meaning to delay or to take more time to do something. It was meant more like not being passive and not saying that as if time is chasing you, as if time is a thing and you're running up like, you know, short of time. Uh, and most of the time people use that as an excuse that we don't have time, we don't have time, you know, and uh, there's no time to do it. Always that I hear that whenever I found like, why are good, better things not being done? So time was always appearing when it came to excuses. And one of the things, as I mentioned, was about um people not wanting to invest in the building processes the little time that it may need to think like in a building site if a mason has to do something if you t i used to tell them listen it's a new thing these next three days don't even count anything just take the pressure off this doesn't count what is three days in a whole building's thing that three days will not typically on the first day people are sitting on their head with deadlines so i think it was the whole notion of we have to make time, I wanted to switch it to take time. It's something you're choosing to do. It's a, it's for me, taking time is like, I'm taking the time to come here. I'm, it's a choice. It's, it's not meant to delay, it's that meaning. It's like to take it in your hands and to take, uh, you know, I believe, uh, I think I always look for freedom in that kind of sense since, uh, early on and I wanted to command my own time you know and I think no matter what constraints you have in your life and what other prisons chosen or or mm -hmm. given we live in some time we can we have agency over and I feel like I don't like to be a victim of circumstances I feel like I want to create things and I want to feel that time is my friend you know it's not chasing me it's the thing I'm the more I take time, the more soothing it is. If I take an hour before I go to work, I have a lot of time 
and my day feels long and I think good things do take time and I think uh, it's a big folly to say that let's cut back and and this idea of time is money is a, a thing I never bought this concept you know I don't agree with it so it was more a reaction to the definition that uh, industrialization colonization etc made on people's time you know and made us believe that it's a it's a myth for me so i don't know if it answers your question but i think time is all you have and better use it. it's a very underutilized resource many people um, you know i'm sure we are we all spend a lot of time like you are doing here but i mean it more in a general way about life you know i want to feel like yes i have the time in fact in my whatsapp thing is written there is time for what matters. So you can interpret like if you, you know. But yeah, I think time time is a thing I uh, absolutely like space. It's fascinating. I think these are wide abstract things and then you colonize what you occupy, whether in space or in time. Um. Well, thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, I had a question, but then you said you'd try not to work in Europe, so maybe it's irrelevant, oh, but I, I will ask it anyway. Um, you, you, you mentioned a very interesting uh, concept of why are we always trying to uh, standardize, I don't know, like a building component to use it in like a structural manner or mm -hmm. instead of, you know, using I don't know, firing a brick less and then using it in a non-structural manner. I think this, in especially in academia, we have the luxury of not having to abide by code, therefore we have more liberty. And then one thing students are trying now a lot when they reclaim material and they try to analyze where can I use this piece, is it still structurally viable? And do you think we will ever reach the point where we can within code because we have to build with more liber like liberty and I think when we can't afford our codes then we will change the codes we are you know I don't think it's written in stone and again nothing against codes there are a lot of in and standardization I I use a lot of standard things you know um I'm not against standardization I'm I'm against that being the only option and I'm against using a standard thing when it clearly doesn't work and I'm also aware that with standardization for all the conveniences it gives us it also gives us a lot of wastage like if I need 1.1 meter of something and I'll have to buy two meters you know and then I won't know what to do with the 90 and there's I see these things all over the place and I see them only because I came I grew up in a place where we valued each and everything. Like, you know, even when you pour water, they'll say, do you want more? They want, If you're not going to plan to drink it, we were not given, you know? Like, you have to use carefully. So I started seeing things with those eyes. I'm not against modular, standard, nothing. I'm against the mindlessness uh, in, in, you know, being hypnotized by those things. And also similarly with the codes. I think every day very new new things are being created many laws are being you know we we all used to be smoking in the cinema i don't know if you remember we used to be you know smoking in the planes and all no and our teachers used to smoke up and down when they would lecture us overnight we have a new rule and we don't so i also am a person who sees that these codes etc are used as an excuse by many people uh, who don't who are lazy i feel because there you you can, new things are entering every day because someone did the work and then established those things you know and regulations are also being made every day when like look at copenhagen how they are systematically making space with the bicycle for the for the for the you know taking away from the space for the cars so but many times we don't see those things we create myths and we don't see that indeed codes can be changed or that or, or improved or or make exceptions for you know and I think the problem is not so much actually with the code it's a problem with people not thinking 
anymore. Somebody thought and made a code. And if there is something that need calls for a review, it should be done. You know, that's what I'm is more meant like that. And uh, regarding working in Europe, it's it's like I think teaching is also a work in a way and research. And I think it's just that I have done, I've had a very exciting practice. And, and even when I was there, I wasn't chasing projects. Again, when clients weren't coming, I wasn't like very anxious. How will I feed my office and things? I'm not that way obsessive. I'm, I always felt, oh, nobody's there. Now I can pursue my own questions when the client is not knocking at the door. I have a lot of things to do when there are no clients. So in that sense, and I built a lot and everything. If something comes, which is exciting, I would like to do it. But I don't feel inadequate if I'm not, I have no project in Europe in that sense, you know. I feel here it's a fertile ground for me to teach. And it's it's not that it's for me teaching, research, architecture is all architecture. It's just thinking. Very nice. Um questions plenty. First one, sir. Yeah. Uh I'm Nishant, I'm from India, so thank you for your perspective and it, it kind of reflects on what we think. So uh, we do a course in Valdaura that deals with more of construction with hands. So I would like to take the questions further because apart from knowing what the material does, like how you say, to the very minute of how it's produced and how you can be more efficient, exactly where it wants to be, uh, looking back at how India works or how, it, how they function, you are already having a large system that eats off this standardization more so. But um, once you start to construct, you realize a lot more things because you become one with the material and you start to speak the own language. So when you're speaking a higher language than standardization to a point where you see what's, what works and what doesn't, how do you start to imply it to a system where you know you could, because I don't feel like the current system is ready to accept this kind of a system in it. It need not have a form of reformation, I would say, but a mode of... Um, understanding where you can change certain things so mm -hmm. in a term of a like a larger scale when you want this to be a norm a basic rather than preaching vernacular right. vernacular architecture we need to start saying hey that's how we do things and yeah. in which light would you try to proceed to make that the new norm in india at least i think i think I wouldn't try to replace one norm with another norm. I think it's just good to create awareness. And first of all, I just, my approach is, I just do my thing. And I think, see, the very fact that I'm here or wherever else, it's spreading what is relevant. I don't have to impose or go on that mission personally as a person that I am. But I think when you do something, it is contagious, you know, uh, good and bad whatever and i i don't feel like i have to fix everything or i have to you know but i am just a conscious member of our society and there are others thinking we are all together in this you know and i think together we discuss share i'm sharing my journey you all are doing so it's i think the action and change will happen in the mini projects you and me and others are going to do and they will all add up i i feel it like that because i don't actually believe that architecture um, now of course many of us feel that it is the mainstream way to do the a developer driven practice and only large projects where more than 800 people have to work in one firm i i don't think it's the only way to do a thing you know like we know very well that when you will make one biryani in the house for five people it's going to be tasty you know uh, it's like a paella for us uh, but i mean you know, if you are going, very few people can cook on weddings with thousand people and still it comes out good. We know that it is very difficult to do that. And so I don't know whether we must now come up with another way, another thing which we are going to equally mass produce. I am actually reacting against the mass produ produce thing itself. I think architecture is a custom made product. And uh, small studios do very good work like look all over Spain itself you know and I think like homemade food it is maybe like if okay you can eat out but if if they say only you can eat drink coffee in Starbucks from tomorrow it would be as ridiculous right I mean you need to have both you can have both but you can't I mean we, we don't have to ourselves believe 
that just because there's going to be new machines, new digital, it doesn't mean that we, nobody stops me today to fix my own button in my shirt or to make a cake at home sometimes. We, these are things we are free people, we can do. And I think small studios will produce that kind of work in the future too. I think I think decentral I'm I'm for decentralization because I think the needs are not common. I don't think everybody has to live in the exact same plan of a housing apartment as the only way to manage the future. I right. hope oh sorry one more line I would want to have many many hundreds and hundreds of small studios doing their own expression than to have one to take whatever worked for me and make it like now everybody's yeah yeah thank you so much uh sorry for... i'm going to try to give shorter answers i'm the no 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 it's perfect talking no worries we love it uh actually i think there's a lot more questions that will come but i propose to close now uh the events and we can continue with a couple of drinks for the one that i hear physically and thank you for the one that was online thank you very much thank you